All the people who will be in attendance in person seem to be here. Um, and hopefully, I heard a number of beeps on the phone, so hopefully that means most of the people on the phone are here. So it's a little bit after one, so I think we might as well get started. For those of you who don't know me, and that might be many of you, because this is my first time uh, leading an IPRP meeting. Uh, my name is David Zismore. I've been an analyst here at the CPUC for about three years. Uh, Eric Green, uh, who previously had this task, is semi-retired, which means he's here every once in a while, but he's not the uh, not front and center on, on meetings such as this anymore. Um, he can still be reached at his email, which I assume many of you might still have in your contact list. Um, but for the time being, um, I'm heading up a lot of the Diablo Canyon related uh, proceedings and meetings and, and so on and so forth. So I, I would be the person to contact. Uh, and if Eric needs to be consulted, then uh, I get to do that. So, um, so yeah, like I said, Eric is semi-retired, which means I'm on the case for the IPRP as well as the other Diablo Canyon related issues. Um, I've been shadowing Eric for, for several years, so fortunately I'm not too much of a neophyte on the issues here. Um, I definitely have a lot of work to do catching up to Eric, who been doing this significantly longer than I have, uh, but fortunately he's, uh, I hope he's taught me well and um, it'll be a smooth transition. Uh, before we get started with the meeting, I'm supposed to give the safety speech. Uh, the safety speech is if there's an emergency, a fire, earthquake, well earthquake I hope you all know what to do, you're Californians. Um, but if there's an emergency, the evacuation protocol is to exit to the streets to the left, which I believe is Golden Gate, and then the uh, the the uh, area where we all uh, end up meeting is in the the courtyard space between the Herbs Theater and the Opera House, uh, one block over across from City Hall. Um, hopefully, that won't be an issue. Um, and if you haven't signed in on the sign-in sheets, uh, I would appreciate it if you did before you left, uh, because I know there are some new people uh, involved in this process besides myself, and if I can make sure that I get everyone's contact info to include you on future emails, if I haven't already, uh, I would really appreciate it. So um, PG&E is going to make presentations on the probabilistic risk assessment as well as the LTSP um, and then everybody will get a chance to chime in and discuss um, so if uh, Valerie or I, I don't know if you're the one doing the presentation or if someone else from PG&E is doing it um, please feel free to get started okay and great. oh sorry one more thing and anyone on the phone who wishes uh, anyone on the phone make sure to keep your phones on mute uh, until you have something that you like, to, if you, unless you have something you'd like to chime in about at any point during the presentation, uh, we'll be happy to answer your questions. Great, and this is Valerie Wynn with PG&E, and we have two presentations today. The first will be on our seismic probabilistic risk assessment that Nozar, to my left here in the room, will be presenting. Okay. And then, Sorry, and Valerie. then we'll do the intros. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I was going to say this. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> As I said, there's some new people here, so if we could do introductions, that would be good too. Right. And then and the second presentation will be by Stu Nishenko to my right, who's doing the 2017 long-term uh, seismic plan update. But before we jump into their presentations, yes, it would be helpful, I think, if we go around the room and just have quick introductions, because there are some new faces um, from PG&E, so you'll know who's here um, for us and what their area of expertise is. And then, you know, perhaps some new folks either here in the room or on the line for the IPRP. So, um, David, you've introduced yourself, so I guess we'll start over here on the, the right. David? Uh, David Weissman, Alliance for Nuclear Responsibility. Uh, Douglas Hamilton, consulting geologist. Rochelle Becker, Alliance for Nuclear Responsibility. Justin Cochran, California Energy Commission. Albert Kaki, pg e geotechnical earthquake engineer. Jeff Bachberg, PG&E Director of Geosciences. Stu Nishenko, PG&E Principal Seismologist. Valerie Wynn, uh, PG&E Regulatory Relations. Nozer Jalanger, PG&E Seismic Engineering. 
Mason Barber, PG&E, Papa Ballistic Risk Assessment. Bill Horstman, PG&E, Seismic Engineering. Katie Waddell, PG&E, Seismologist. Tim Dawson, California Geological Survey, IPRP. I'm Robert Budnitz, I'm with the Diablo Canyon Independent Safety Committee. And uh, that's everyone in the room in San Francisco. If there's okay. anyone on the phone. Oh, oh John I'm sorry. Giesman's back one, one more person in the room. John Giesman, an attorney for the Alliance for Nuclear Science Building. Didn't, didn't see you. There's not a problem. Um, that's everyone in the room now. Uh, anyone on the phone, uh, if you could please just let us know who you are and who you're with. Yeah, I'm Bruce Gibson with the County of San Luis Obispo. And this is Joe Street with the California Coastal Commission. And I'm Ray Chan with the California Geological Survey. This is Bob Anderson with the IPRP Seismic Safety Commission. Okay, I'm going to assume that's everybody. So, Valerie, I guess you're okay. Right. Great. Well, as I indicated, Nozar is going to kick us off talking about the probabilistic risk assessment. Um, the presentation was emailed um, to folks on the phone. You should have received it from me at about 11.30, 11.45 this morning. And if you're here in the room, we do have some hard copy presentations over on the side table. Um, and with that, no, sorry, it's all yours. All right, thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, so this presentation is basically uh, give you an overview of the seismic PRA that we just recently completed and submitted to the uh, NRC. So and could, we get, could we get a microphone for the phone a little closer to the speaker, please? Okay, we're just switching seats here, Bruce. Give us one second. You know, obviously, you can put me far away from the uh, phone, but not those are. It's right in front of you. All right, is this there better? Yeah, that, that sounds better. Very good, thank you. So this is essentially an overview and uh, high-level review of the, uh, the project. So going to slide two, just the... Uh, you want me to do that, slide two, just the uh, picture of the site, units one and two. Slide three, uh, it shows you some of the uh, critical or important structures of the plant, turbine building, containment, intake structure, and the uh, switch yard up above. So just an overview of the site. Slide four is a give you a brief overview of the seismic and licensing history for Diablo Canyon, which is uh, somewhat unique in the industry. Started back in 67 with a deterministic evaluation for design earthquake and double design. Later, the plan was reevaluated and retrofitted uh, for the Hosbury when it was uh, identified in 1976. Then after that, that's where the LTSB came into picture. NRC requested PG&E to do a more detailed analysis and studies of the uh, geology around the site. And that's how LTSB, long-term seismic program, got started. And at the end of that, those studies, PG&E issued a seismic probabilistic risk assessment, which was at the time one of the earlier ones and state of knowledge at the time. So fast forward, going all the way to the right side, essentially uh, the LTSB continued for researchers and uh, uh, additional studies. Then in 2011, once we had the uh, Fukushima event, the NRC requested all sites to perform another updated seismic hazard uh, and if needed, perform a risk, perform, a risk, uh, risk assessment uh, with that. So this is in from 2012. The event was in 11, but from 12, NRC issued the request for additional information. And until now, 2018, we issued the report and we wait for the NRC to do their assessment. So just a quick overview how LTSP and how seismic PRA at Diablo Canyon got started. So it was from 1988 and now again 
30 years later in 2018, a full update. Again, some of the key milestones now from post Fukushima. In uh, March of 2012, the NRC sent their request for additional studies. And then some of the deliverables were we had to do a seismic walkdown issue, a report to the NRC. NRC subsequently reviewed and accepted the, uh, the results. Then in 2015, we issued the updated hazard, what they call a seismic uh, hazard screening and evaluation report. So at that point, we issued that, and the NRC subsequently in 2016 issued the staff letter uh, indicating that the evaluation is acceptable to proceed with the next step being the SPRA. So the topic of our discussion here, which is 2018, we issued the SPRA in April 24th, and then we're, NRC is gonna be reviewing that. We anticipate it will take them anywhere probably six months to a year to perform that review and then respond back to us uh, about any potential uh, follow-ups if there's necessary. Next slide, slide six. So what's SPRA? Why do we do SPRA? It's trying to, the purpose of it essentially is to determine the likelihood of seismically induced core damage accidents <coughs> or likelihood of seismically induced large early release radiation. I'll try to explain that a little bit uh, on the next slide. And another thing that you do get from this, you identify potential risk contribution from structure, systems, and components. So in other words, it narrows it down what is, how much of this total risk that we're getting is contributed to the containment structure or to this uh, relay or to various components so you can get a better sense where the critical components are in order of their contribution to the risk. In order to do SPRA, there are three major elements that need to be done. The hazard analysis that we briefly talked about that we submitted initially. Then fragility evaluation. Try to explain that a little bit later, but just the overview. So you need three elements, hazard, fragility and probabilistic risk, uh, and the PRA model, if you will. And then once you do all of these and you develop your seismic PRA, it goes through a process of peer review for technical adequacy assessment. So again, this part of the NRC process requires the uh, utilities to go through an external independent team uh, of folks that review all of our documents, calculations, reports, tests, everything, and uh, provide their assessment where we meet uh, the standards, the ASME standards that are, that are intended to meet. This is a flow chart. It's, uh, yeah, you don't need to memorize this one. <laughs> it's a little busy, but. It's a little busy, but the intent is basically just to show the relationship between the three elements. So you have the hazard, you have the fragility, and you have the PRA. So the hazard, which is a step one essentially, once the hazard is developed, it feeds into the PRA model, and it feeds into the fragility evaluation. Once the fragilities are done, they feed their results into the PRA model. And the PRA model itself develops the, the, the logics for various accident scenarios. And then once it combines it with the other two inputs, it goes and it develops what we call the seismic core damage frequency and seismic large early release frequency. So essentially all of that is to give you a perception of what is the uh, what is the risk numbers uh, associated with uh, with the seismic events for Diablo Canyon. Oh, one thing uh, the the hazard analysis that we performed so far, the seismic studies and that we initially reported to the NRC, it took care of this portion of the work basically. This was to, perf to find the hazard at the site, which was this, and develop a ground motion response vector, which was this. 
So these were done initially as part of the 2015 submittal. The NRC accepted the report, and then from this point on, the SPRA developed additional hazard information that goes into the analysis. So I'll try to explain a little bit more what these uh, steps were as we get to these various uh, elements. So the, the conclusion was basically, what are the numbers basically, and what do they mean? So the seismic core damage frequency, after you complete it, the seismic core damage frequency comes up in 2.78 times 10 to the minus 5. And large early release, it's 5.4 times to the minus 6. Are those, are those the mean of the, of the distribution? That's yes. the mean, yes. Yes, that's correct. And some of the key drivers for station blackout, for CDF, instrument, instrumentation failure, building failure, containment exterior shell, these are the various scenarios that uh, contribute the most to the, uh, to the risk. So to put the numbers in spectrum, okay, what does that mean and how does it compare to other plants, for example? So this, is, this was a, uh, a preliminary informal comparison that we made in 2017 with some of the other plants that are performing this work. Uh, and what we noted that the Diablo Canyon numbers, is, this was the Diablo Canyon, so one is a core damage frequency, the other one is large early release. The, the orange brownish is the large early release number. That's for Diablo Canyon. And then this was the, the average of the, these plants that are in this uh, sample, basically. So if you notice, our number was in line with the average of the plants. So some are higher, some are lower. But I'm going to caution you that this, was, this is fluid since some of the other plants, they're still going through their, uh, their work to refine their uh, models and do their work. But big picture, the NRC <coughs> came up with essentially about 20 plants that would have to do seismic PRA, and of which five so far have been completed and submitted to the NRC. We're, we were uh, one of the five. And then a few of the plant uh, uh, canceled this SPRA because uh, they're shutting down. But the rest of the plants, they're all scheduled to be completed by end of 2019. So we will get a better, more accurate representation of uh, the, 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 uh, the spectrum on this uh, probably in about a year, year and a half or so, once the other plants are completed. So seismic hazard, what, what do we do for seismic hazard? I guess uh, the best to describe it is there is source characterization and then the ground motion attenuation. So the source characterization, figuring out what is the capability of this fault. Ground motion attenuation, which shows how does this uh, the earthquake travel through soil and gets to the plant. And so you get the ground motion attenuation uh, on this. And then from there we develop the uh, site response based on the site amplification and, uh, and other <coughs> specific site information. So this is what was done initially, like I said, back in 2017. All of this work is done through various studies, including the AB1632 and others. So going, going forward from uh, 2016, once the NRC said it's okay to proceed, we're taking all this information to develop FERS, Foundation Input Response Spectra, and these other time histories. I'll show you these are information needed to hand it off to the next group, which are the fragility folks, to do the analysis for components. So. This was the result of the 19 or 2015, the hazard information. Uh, we got the hazard for the, for the uh, site and the uh, site response. 
file a motion to respond to that. So again, the NRC's conclusion was licensee evaluated seismic hazards suitable for use in other seismic assessments associated with 5054F letter and that concluded their assessment of that piece. So once we say, so what do we have to do? So we have to develop foundation <coughs> input response vector. What that is, is basically we're taking individual buildings and we're developing ground motion for that specific building as opposed to one for the site. There is some variability on soil response on site, so we're taking the foundation response, we're taking the ground motion response under each individual building. So that's the first. So the first were developed and as you can tell, these are the three buildings that we chose for doing first, which is turbine building, containment, and auxiliary building. And turbine building is slightly higher than the auxiliary building, and it's slightly higher than the turbine building. They're all relatively close. There's not a whole lot of uh, separation between them, but it's more accurate this way. These are the horizontal responses, and this is the corresponding vertical response. So aside from developing first, the other components that were considered are non-vibratory hazards, meaning seismic slope stability, potential tsunami impact, and secondary fault ruptures at the site, and potential impact and components were also considered. So hazard insight. I was going to ask Albert to just briefly touch on these. He's uh, closely familiar with them. Thanks, Mr. So, uh, Can you get a little closer to the mic, yeah. Albert? So, folks on the phone, if you can't hear me, let me know. Um, so, these this is just insights gained from looking at the hazard um, at the hard rock level, and that is first that. At Diablo Canyon, the close seismic sources dominate the hazard. And so that's the Hosgree, Shoreline, Los Osos, and San Luis Bay, San Luis Bay Faults. Um, so those contribute over 90% of the total hazard above 0.3 G. Um, when we look at what drives the uncertainty, the median ground motion models and total uncertainty models dominate the ground motion characterization. Um, and that's their contribution to the uncertainty is because of the significant reduction in uncertainty associated with the seismic source characterization through the LTSP process. Um, this has, and the research done through the LTSP has constrained the slip rates on the faults. Um, we've got close distance saturation of large magnitude events that also contributes to reducing the uncertainty. Uh, we've got high seismicity rates. And again, the four sources all, are all close and all sort of equal contributors. Okay, so um, Nozer talked a little bit about more, a little about a little bit about the GMRS, which is sort of a free field, plant level ground motion. And when we start looking at structural analysis, we need to develop input motions that are appropriate for specific structures. And in the nuclear industry, we refer to we refer to these as FERS or Foundation Input Response Spectra. And as he mentioned, they were developed for three different structures: the containment, auxiliary, and turbine buildings. We compute horizontal FERS, um, and the FERS are computed in a way that is consistent with calculation of the GMRS, which is the free field motion. And the calculation of the horizontal FERS for Diablo Canyon used a combination of both empirical, that is observed ground motions and ground motion amplification, as well as analytical site amplification coming from numerical models. And again, this approach is consistent with the general approach that was used for the GMRS. Once we have Horizontal FERS, we then compute the associated vertical component of the ground motion using um, the Glerche and Abrahamson 2007 V over H ratio model. FERS define the response spectrum, but don't provide inputs sufficient for a structural analysis. So we need time series that are describing the um, variation acceleration with time that we can input into a structural analysis model. Uh, so suites of 30 spectrally matched ground motions where each suite it comp 
comprises of three components um, are developed. Uh, the process of selecting those 30 uh, suites of 30 motions sort of followed a graded approach where initially a set of 100 time, seed time series were selected based off of magnitude, distance, um, VS30, which is the time averaged shear wave velocity in the top 30 meters, and also usable frequency range from the um, reported ground motions. From these 100, we reduced them down to 40 time series based off of um, spectral shape assessment and also looking at the cross-correlation requirement. This is a requirement by the NRC um, and to ensure that uh, there's difference between the different horizontal components. Um, again, we reduced the motions further based off of distribution of the duration. Um, we were looking for a, a total, uh, we were looking for a average duration, so we selected motions to fit that. And finally, uh, those raw time histories were spectrally matched to the target FERS, um, and in a way that accommodated a peak to trough variability that is not included in the definition um, of, from the, uh, of the GMRS or FERS. And um, that peak to trough variability was only applied to horizontal um, because we've got different orientations and um, the vertical was used directly. Uh, so the FERS provides uh, input to structural analysis, but we also want to look at non-vibratory hazards as part of this SPRA effort. Um, we looked at uh, a number of non-vibratory hazards, and these three um, rose to, as ones that we needed to do specific calculations for and could not be screened out exclusively. We looked at tsunami fl flooding um, using a vector hazard analysis, so we're looking at the combination of both ground motion and flooding events. Um, and here the tsunamis are generated through offshore landslides generated by that shaking event um, and not through some sort of fault rupture scenario. Uh, we also looked at slope deformation. Um, slope deformation is occurring due to seismic um, ground motions, uh, and it's considered uh, for several ground motions in several facilities or um, slopes. Uh, we use probabilistic methods to define the deformation hazard curve, so that's what is the uh, annual frequency of exceeding a specific displacement. Um, and the approach that we used used a simplified dy dynamic model uh, with consideration of alternatives to both models and um, parameters to those models. And we also looked at the potential for a secondary fault rupture. Um, so that's rupture not on the main trace of the fault, but some distance off the fault. We were considering how uh, the potential for secondary fault rupture could impact the auxiliary salt water pipes, or ASW pipes. Um, and so we're looking at displacement across the pipes and whether or not the dresser couplings could open up as a result of that displacement. Uh, and again, the vector hazard analysis was used to consider both ground motion and fault displacement here. Uh, we passed all of these non-vibratory hazards to the, the SPRA, SPRA effort to evaluate their significance in the uh, total risk for the plant. All right, thank you. So moving on to the uh, second element of the three being the fragility evaluation. So, like we mentioned, the fragility already receives input from, from the hazard, like we talked the time histories that Albert just talked about, and the, uh, uh, the, and the, and the furs, basically, that was fed into the uh, fragility evaluation. And that's essentially the key parameters for fragility are soil structure interaction analysis, walk down of all the components, basically, and the fragility calculations, basically. These are the three key elements that you have to do for performing fragility evaluation. So what is fragility, I guess, definition? Defin fragility of a system, structure, or component is a conditional probability of its failure at a given hazard input level. So saying it a simpler way, the, the bigger the earthquake, the higher the chance of the component failing. That's all it means, basically, right? So if this bottle of water is going to survive a 0.1 earthquake, we're saying there's like 5% chance of that this bottle is going to tip over and fall, right? But you say if I have a 2G earthquake, 
I'm going to tell you there's a 95% chance that this bottle is going to tip over and fail. And there's a distribution between here and there which is going to be shown by this curve. So you do this analysis for all the components and structures that are in the model uh, for the uh, seismic probability, uh, for the PRA model. So that's essentially what the fragility is. So again, going back to the, uh, the three el the elements that are used for fragility, so the objective is to determine realistic seismic response of the structures and then develop ground motion response on each component level. So foundation input responses and time histories and soil uh, profiles were used. So that's done through soil structure interaction. What that means is that if I was to take this building and I shake it at the bottom, at the foundation level, I can come up and find out what is my response at this water bottle level or what is my response at that light level. So I can get responses at individual locations for components that I want to look at and do, it, do analysis for. So it gets, and, uh, and it looks at the interaction between the building and the soil and the rock that's uh, underneath it. So it's looking at all that and gives you a suite of 30 responses for each location which we use the average of for determining the the load on this component, basically. All right. Let's see. So we, and this is just basically a couple of samples of, uh, we perform uh, three dimensional models of all the, uh, the three buildings, turbine building, ox, and containment. And this is just to illustrate that basically there's enough nodes on this that once you shake it on the bottom, you can come up at the individual location and get a response. So it includes all the amplifications through the building to the component. So in summary for fragility, uh, what's different? This model and the old, the old one, we have added new components to the model. Again, it's an updated model. Things have been added and subtracted from the plant, and the PRA model itself has improved over the years. Fragilities were calculated using uh, site-specific data by using a separation of variability method, which is approved by the NRC, and this is the uh, the most accurate way, the most realistic that you can do for components. Capacity, uh, capacities uh, represent both units. So if we had with this bottle of water, unit one, and same location on unit two, if unit two was a little bit off and the response was lower, we use that one in the model, basically. So we use the more conservative number in the model. We found, oops, we found out that one of the uh, uh, important factor was the fire water sprinkler piping in the auxiliary building as a significant risk contributor. And then we found that there is a ventilation duct that's crossing between auxiliary building and turbine building that does not have uh, adequate gap between the uh, adequate gap on the uh, ventilation duct to allow for displacement difference between the two buildings. I'll show you a picture in a second. And then all the fragility parameters were uh, calculated and provided that information to the PRA model again. So this is the uh, element two of the three that fed into the PRA model now. So it's all building up to PRA model. The, this was the issue that we discovered essentially that these ventilation ducts, the, the building down here, you can't see it very well, it's a concrete here, it's the auxiliary building, and this brown uh, portion here is a turbine building, they're right next to each other. And this ventilation duct comes from the auxiliary building into the turbine building. It turns and it goes back and connects to the auxiliary building if you can follow that, right? So these are the connections to the turbine building, and these are the connections to the auxiliary building. 
So these two buildings, they have their own independent motion and they may not be in phase, so they move differently. And when they do that, these supports or this, uh, the, the ducts could be damaged as a result of uh, the similar movements. So this was identified and uh, we considered that in our analysis and it's in the uh, process of being uh, retro or up modified and it's in schedule to be modified uh, in next two outages for the two units. There is two, lo two locations per unit. This is that's the representative uh, sample of the two. So PRA, size of PRA, again, the key item in here is basically, so we got the hazard is already coming in from the hazard analysis, and we have fragilities that are coming in from fragility analysis. Then the PRA model has a planned logic model that has its own internal uh, uh, information that goes in there. And it, it defines all the components that are in the model and it looks at the operator action uh, reliability and it looks at the relay chatter, potential uh, consequence of relay chatters in the seismic event. So it has all the mod logic model built into it and it adds these other elements to it and it goes through some quantification and series of other work and essentially develops this seismic core damage frequency and seismic uh, large early release uh, frequency number. But before we say we're done with this, if you notice there's a step in here that it has to go through a peer review and which we'll talk a little bit about the process on that. So it did go through a peer review. They had a number of mm, facts and observations uh, that we had to address, which we addressed, and then it went back to a second phase that another set of uh, independent peer reviewers came in and looked at to ensure that we adequately addressed the question. Then they closed the findings, basically, at that point. Once all that is done, then we can say that this is ready it meets the standards and we will come later at that point. So as for insight, I'm just going to ask Nathan to just give us a little bit of update on, hit, on the insight for uh, the PRA. Okay, so we're on slide 25 for those of you on the phone. So as Nuzar mentioned earlier, one of the important um, aspects of the seismic carry is uh, that it allows us to uh, estimate risk in, or to, to identify risk in sites and, and identify components that are important from a seismic risk perspective. So those importances are, are calculated by using the output of the seismic PRA and comparing the relative contribution to risk from different uh, types of failure scenarios. So from this we found that uh, we found a number of components that were important to seismic risk. Uh, the condensate storage tank, firewater storage tank, uh, were found to be important because these tanks uh, are required for, for most scenarios in order to mitigate core damage. Uh, the main control room vertical boards were found to be important. Uh, the, these are important essentially because uh, they allow the operators to control the progression of the accident, and if there is some control loss, it does affect their ability to do that. Uh, non load bearing wall failures <coughs> were found to be important and the diesel generator rooms, uh, four KV switch gear rooms. Uh, these walls are important because they can affect the safety related to power supplies to, to frontline plant equipment. Um, we also found that the RCP safe shutdown seals were very important. These seals um, allow a successful accident mitigation without any uh, cooling to, to the RCPs themselves. In addition to these components, there were some structures that were found important. The auxiliary building uh, was one of the most important buildings from a core damage risk perspective. Uh, that's mainly because the, all of the components important to risk are located in this building. Containment building also uh, is important to both core damage and large early release because it is, um, it, it again houses important components and also provides a, a barrier to the release of radiation. <coughs> Uh, one thing that's different with the seismic carrier is that we, we added consideration of certain operator actions, these flex mitigation actions, 
these actions were, were found to be very important for scenarios which involved a uh, seismically induced uh, station blackout, a, lot, a complete loss of AC power. <coughs> And as I mentioned, that the firewater storage tank uh, and firewater storage piping were important. Uh, the PRA identified that the operator actions to isolate a break of the firewater uh, piping system was, was also a very important action. So slide 27 has a picture of the uh, seismic core damage frequency results as a function of spectral acceleration. Uh, this is um, uh, an interesting slide to look at it. What it shows is that most of the risk contribution comes from earthquakes with a spectral acceleration above 2G. Uh, and, and it's interesting to note that that's, that's above the, uh, the spectral acceleration associated with the Hosby earthquake. So slide 28 uh, shows the results from the previous uh, seismic PRA. In 1988, the, the PRA result showed that the seismic core damage frequency was 3.8 times 10 to minus 5. The updated results that we just completed in the last year show that the core damage frequency is about 2.8 times 10 to minus 5 per year. <coughs> and this is mainly due to, um, well, first of all, that, that update involved a complete update of, of all of the elements, the fragility elements, uh, new hazard, and an, over, uh, an updated seismic carry model. Um, it also reflects the risk reduction that we saw um, as a result of incorporating the new safe shutdown seals as well as incorporation of these uh, operator flex actions. Thank you. So. The last bit is about the independent peer review, the last item that we mentioned. So we have, you have all the three elements completed, you have the PRA, then you engage a independent team. So the way that works is NRC has prescribed a method to a process. It's per NEI, Nuclear Energy Institute, guidance 12-13, that you use that process essentially perform your uh, uh, evaluation for technical adequacy to make sure compliance to the uh, standard. So we did this thing and uh, I called it phase one and phase two. Phase one is essentially the peer review that we had a team uh, that was independent, external subject matter experts that were uh, uh, we, we, uh, we started the review on, uh, in May and we gave them all the documents and they had a month to review that and they posed a lot of questions that we provided answers to. And then uh, the team which was composed of 10 uh, individuals and we also had four NRC observers and two Japanese uh, observers. All they came to San Luis Obispo. We spent one week face to face going through all the questions and answers and whatever. So during that week, they posed more questions and they actually did a walk down on site to do their own visual inspections. And at the end of the week, they issued a series of uh, facts and observations and issued a report in September of 2017. So the facts and observations, we call them FNOs, basically uh, cite their opinion of or their judgment of uh, the work that was done, how it meets against the standards, basically. And they provide a recommended solution to, uh, to correct those. So, so we proceeded with uh, revising all the documents to resolve all the FNOs. Then you go to the, what is called phase two in here, Again, this is a process that was recently put out by the NRC. They call them, uh, it's an independent assessment to review and close resolutions, basically. So you bring another set of team, or if the original team is available, they can come back and review the documents. So we gave them the documents again in uh, uh, October time frame. Then we met in San Francisco in November. We went over the documents again with them. Then after that, uh, 
we went through some common resolutions and what have you, effectively the issues were all solved by January, but it took a little bit to, uh, for our peer reviewers to, to, uh, to issue a finished report. So the, the report was issued in March of 2018, closing all the previous findings as being satisfactory and resolved. So what are the next steps? The next step is essentially like uh, we talked about the NRC staff is doing their technical analysis. We anticipate roughly about a year. We're anticipating the NRC's uh, request for additional information. And then at that point, after that's done, the NRC will form an internal panel of experts according to NTTF uh, 2.1 phase two process to decide if any additional actions are required. To date, I believe they have done this thing for two plans, right? Well, yes, there are two plans that have been completed and they got their letter back. And I believe they didn't ask them to do any more work because they're relatively low seismic size, if I'm not mistaken. <coughs> and then, uh, so the commitments that we made with the letter that was sent out to the NRC basically that uh, we will continue to assess plan modifications and changes to ensure the seismic risk is not inadvertently increased by making changes to the plan. So we'll continue to do that. And we're going to finish the, uh, the plan modification for this uh, ventilation that, that we talked about in the upcoming outages in 1R21 and 2R21, which are in uh, 2019, both of them. So there was a question that had come up uh, that was related to us. That there was a uh, statement from our submittal to the NRC that was in page uh, appendix 9 that Basically, we reiterated the uh, a summary of some of the discussions from the hazard team, the hazard reviewers. And where I understand the question was, how did we address these? So this was written in the summary portion of the report, but they effectively turned that question into three separate, that, that uh, summary into three separate questions basically, if you will, that I tried to best characterize it like this. And then for each one, they wrote an F and O that asked essentially that question to pg e to do some uh, work to. Oh, finding, finding an observation. Right, finding an observation. And then what happened, so this was the peer review question, pg and &E provider response, and then the independent review team that came afterwards on phase two, they looked at our response and they decided that, okay, our response essentially answers the questions that were posed by the review team and the issue got closed. And those three responses were essentially follow the same process. <coughs> and they, were all, they were all answered and closed and appropriate documents updated. Right, and pg e circulated yesterday afternoon the excerpts from the document that had the details on the, the, the way the issue was described, the, the fact and observation, and then the resolution. So um, we haven't included all of that detail in the PowerPoint, but you have those pages from the, resort, from the report that were circulated yesterday. So this is essentially the same process that was used for all of the FNOs. We went through the same process and uh, they all got resolved. That brings us to the end of uh, presentation on the SPRA submittal. Okay. And so um, I guess as we go for questions, if you could um, you know, introduce yourself, if you have a reference to a particular page number of Nozar's presentation, that would be helpful. And I guess we'll first go to folks in the room if there are any questions, and then we'll go to the phone. Does that make sense? So any questions in the room on this part of the presentation on the probabilistic risk assessment? 
I, Justin? I have two questions, actually. Um, one is you mentioned uncertainty in your values. So, like on your key values, your core damage frequency, large early release frequency, what's your uncertainty range on that? Is it on the order of 10 to the negative 5 and 10 to the negative 6, or is it lower? So, I, I don't have the exact numbers in front of me, but they're. I think on the um, to the 95th percentile of CDF, there's about an order of magnitude change. So there's there's a quite a wide um, uncertainty in the results for core damage frequency and, and seismic uh, largely release. That's something we can provide exact details on. I just don't have that in front of me right now. I mean that that, that sort of gives me a range. And, the, and I think the majority of that comes from the hazard. So that, that that uncertainty is originating from the hazard analysis. Okay. And then uh, the next question I have is. Um, how, how do you vet or verify your models? I mean, do, do you have like, because you were talking about how you modeled the buildings, and then how do you prove that your model of the building is accurate? Is it dependent upon like a small earthquake, you have sensors there and you determine the response or? No, so we had, we were doing the SSI, soil structure analysis, and we wanted to make sure that the models best reflect uh, as much as the science can tell you at this point. So we actually made a second model. We did a uh, fixed-based model as well. So we, we benchmarked it against that to make sure that the two match. So this one is not, the SSI model is not getting widely different response. So we ran it and compared it with the first to make sure we get a reasonably <coughs> accurate response between. Other questions in the room? Uh, Bob? Go back to slide 27. Right. Now, I understand what this is. Um, this is, and, and this is three to five. This is, five, this is five, spectral, five, right? Five hertz spectral. Uh, yes. five, five hertz spectral, right? Okay. Um, if you look at this carefully, you can see that, except for a small thing down there that I'm going to ask about, there is um, no, no important contribution to the seismic risk of the plant until you get close to around 2G spectral, which is well above the design basis of uh, the spectral acceleration of the plant. It's about the same as Hosmer. Hmm? It's about the same as Hosmer. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a little above it, but it's okay. Um, and I understand that, but I want to ask a question about that thing down there. I assume, I'm going to tell you what I think that is. That's the earthquake causes loss of offside power. Nothing else is damaged. But every so often loss of offside power, there's a non-seismic inability to respond. Okay, you know, there's other things, I mean, because if you lose offside power, it wasn't an earthquake, maybe it's lightning or something like that. There's a small core damage frequency from that. And that's what that is. Do I understand that right, Nathan? Correct. That's the... There are two reasons why that's a little bigger. One is because that is re reflecting the seismically induced loss of offset power uh, failure, as well as a random failure of a diesel, a diesel yeah, generator. The random failure. meaning the non-seismic failure of Correct. other things. Correct. So the other reason that that's also like that is that that bin size is a little bigger than the other than the other bins. So yeah, the yeah. acceleration range is a little higher, and so the integration across that range gives you a higher yeah, I understand, but, but that whole thing, that whole little bar there, more or less, which comes up to about half a 10 by 6, I mean, you know, roughly, right. is from earthquake causes loss of ice power, nothing else, earthquake doesn't harm anything else, but there's a small probability that the rest of the plant just doesn't respond, as, as we understand, because after all, that, that, that's the loss of offset power, normal of entry. That's okay. Great. And then, and then nothing else approaches 10 to the minus 6 until you get to around 2G spectral, I mean a little less. And then then those are the first seismic cause failures that aren't loss of offset power, but the other things. Yes. Okay, and by then, every one of those sequences up there has a, a, it doesn't have offset power. The offset power has long since been gone, but it was lost because it's very, it's very fragile, right? Okay, I just want to be sure I understood that. So the question that I have is, and, uh, that's why I, I want to review the details, and I haven't had a chance to yet, but I'm hoping to. 
is to ask of all those things up there, if every human behaved perfectly, that is, there was no human error after the earthquake, how much of that would uh, would be reduced and how much would be left? I mean, is, is human error in these sequences an important... Well, I think what remember, you've you got 3G, so okay. humans have to, you know, they have to respond in a big, big earthquake. It's a great big earthquake, all right? Right. And so what, one thing I could say is that what, in, in our model, we don't assume any credit for operator actions above 3G. So the, three, the contribution from 3G and up would stay the same. Regardless yeah, but, the, but, but between there and about 3, there's the... Go ahead. Right, so, so you're right. In between, in that range, from, say, 2 to 3G, there would be some reduction um, in the risk contribution if we could assume that operators were flawless. So there would be some reduction. I can't say how much uh, off the top of my head, but there would be some reduction in that contribution. But, I mean, by the way, you should know, I was on a fact-finding uh, meeting about three months ago, two or three months ago, with Nathan was there. And we were talking about just this question. And I remember perfectly well that above about three, uh, 3G or so, humans always fail whenever they're called upon. That's, that's your assumption. Correct. But we know that isn't right. Uh, have you quantified how much that would be if, if you took, I mean, you can do the perfect human, and then you can do some, some in-between reason. So we, we have probably 50 sensitivities that we did looking at scenarios like that. That was one of the things we considered, that if, if we could credit operator actions above 3G, how much of a reduction would we see? And there was, it wasn't a big reduction, but there was some reduction from, uh, from that assumption. And, and, that's, and that's because the humans are not a key component of most of the sequences. Not at that acceleration level, because you have, you have other failures, big equipment failures that are occurring, and it doesn't, okay. for those scenarios, it doesn't matter whether the operators are successful or not, in, in most cases. Just, because too many other things are failing. That's right. At, at the very high earthquake. Right. So the second question I had was, this is core damage frequency. The major figure of merit besides core damage frequency is the possibility of a large early release. Mm -hmm. And in your summary report, you had some words about that. Again, I want to dig into the details. You want to talk to us here just briefly about what something like this looks like for the large releases. Are those, are those potential, they're, they're very low probability compared to this, but are those potential large releases Dominantly way up there too. Yeah, so it looks similar. It's depressed because you have a overall there's a, a, a like you said a lower frequency of release versus core damage frequency. I mean that's the thing I work on, you know. Right, right, and ma the majority of that comes from a containment failure. So you have a containment failure which results in a, in um, core damage and a release of radiation. I think about 50% of the contribution comes from that one type of failure. So, it, it, and again, it looks similar. The, the profile is very similar looking. It's just not uh, the same amplitude that you see for core damage. And that's in, I don't, that isn't in the NRC report, but it is in our yeah, what detailed uh, documentation. Any other questions, Bob? Um, other questions in the room? David? Yes, I was wondering uh, in this, it's kind of hard to do with the voice. <laughs> in the uh, presentation we just saw, the provide um, the answers from the uh, redacted or proprietary report to um, FNO 20-3, 20-9, 20-7. But I was wondering where were the similar responses for 20-4, 20-8, and 20-11, which were also listed on that same chart. Of eventually resolved FNOs. Were they related to the same topic? They were under SHA. They were in the SHA. Well, all the FNOs were resolved. There's nothing open, right? They, they, I, those, I that. And, and so, but thank you for those numbers. Um, obviously, they were not ones that we provided. Um, let us take that back and take a look at those, and if there's additional information we should provide on those, we're happy to do that. You'll find them, actually, they're, in, they're, sub, they're on the if you look at, for example, like 20-3, you have, if you look at the very bottom of 20-3, the very last two lines at the bottom of it, you'll see 20-4 listed. Part of it. Well, that it starts. And then you'll see the same thing like for 20-7, if you go and scroll all the way to the very end, you'll find the wording for 20-8, what the question or the, or the comment was at the bottom. Yeah. 
Um, thanks for pointing that out. As I said, you know, I, I don't have any information to really respond to that right now, so let us go back and look at that and um, see if there's additional information on those three we, sh we could provide to you. All right, other questions in the room? So I guess we'll go to the phone. Um, do we have anyone on the phone who has a question? I do. This is this is Bruce Gibson, and um, I'd like to swim upstream up to back up to the seismic hazard analysis. And it's probably a little bit difficult to do, uh, not being in the room. And I apologize for not being able to be there. But uh, since this is the ITRP, you know, I was going back and reviewing our last report, ITRP report number eleven. And in terms of understanding the acceleration at the site. We had a couple of concerns. One of them was that the that the nature of the source of earthquakes in the Irish Hills was not very well constrained, because the structure of the Irish Hills was not very well constrained. And so there's one question as to how that was handled in the seismic hazard analysis. But the bigger one that that we saw there was the uncertainty in the site amplification. Uh, the site amplification, because we found that the um, th that the VF30 wasn't really well understood uh, in the sense that we we had information from borings and we also had information from some surface wave dispersion, if I remember correctly, that didn't agree very well. And the complexity of the structure, not only in one dimension but three, was actually you know, rather large relative to the simplification of a VS-30. So with that said, I'm wondering as I look at peer review question and the, the resolution of 20-3, of how that uncertainty was resolved, if in fact it was resolved, or whether we still uh, are uncertain by a fairly significant factor as to the amount of site amplification, um, you know, not, not to mention the azimuthal potential for some azimuthal variation there. Um, okay, thanks, thanks for that, um, Bruce. I guess, and I, I'm not sure, I'll ask the question of the PG&E team, do, because we, we, we kind of viewed the seismic hazard analysis as something we've already provided previously and talked about, so I don't know if we have the expert here in the room because I think Norm worked on a lot of that stuff. And yeah, Norm, guys, Norm and Stu should be fairly familiar with the concerns raised by our ITRP, and I just didn't, I, I just couldn't, within my limited time to review this information, I couldn't see that those ITRP uh, concerns were uh, resolved in this analysis. Okay, and so, well, Stu's sitting here with me, and I'll ask Stu if he has the information to be able to respond to that question. Otherwise, that would probably be another thing that we would have to take back and look at the uncertainty around the the Irish Hills and the site amplification um, and the VS30 um, element of that. So, Stu, is that something you're able to take a shot at? Well, what I can provide is information about our understanding of the, the Irish Hills, the structure and the seismic hazard associated with that. A little bit later in my presentation, I'll uh, present some new information that we've been doing trying to just understand why the Irish Hills are uplifting, which has been a question that this group has asked repeatedly through our meetings. Uh, and then and other work that we have in process to uh, further resolve that question. Getting back to site response issues, that's not really in my wheelhouse. And so either Nozar or Albert, can you say sure about that? Um, so first of all, site amplification is identified as a primary contributor to uncertainty. So this is something that we want to continue to research, and we'll talk about that more when we get to the LTSP research topics. When we talk about how we perform the site response and site amplification studies, we use two approaches. Neither of them considered VS30 as the metric of, of choice. One used recordings at the site and looked at differences in ground motion due to um, and, identify, and identification of amplification solely based off of those recordings. So that's our empirical site amplification model. 
Right, that, that was for just two earthquakes, so is that that, that data set? Uh, I believe there's three earthquakes in there, but it is rather limited. Um, additionally, we had uh, 3D velocity models developed, and from those 3D velocity models, we looked under footprints of the specific facilities and developed then a collection of 1D profiles. Um, and from those 1D profiles, we then developed uh, base case and uncertainty bounds about those velocity profiles, and we used those into uh, analytical site amplification studies. Um, and then we combined both the analytical and empirical site amplification models um, using some weight factors. Okay, and so that, 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 sounds, that sounds familiar from the last time the IPRP dug into this. Yeah. They, again, the, the concern was that two or now three earthquakes really didn't provide much control and when you start talking about the 3D velocity, I get it that there are 3D velocity models, mm -hmm. but, you know, and I think it's on the list of things dg and &E is going to be working on to actually do the site amplification with 3D wave equation modeling because we know that the one, taking any 1D profile, even if you, if right. you run a, basically a Monte Carlo on the, on the suite of those, really doesn't get at the actual ground response because you've got right. differences on, you know, what, what azimuth and, and, uh, and other angles, you've got that site being illuminated by the earthquake wave. So I, I was just, uh, you know, I'm trying to play catch up here. It's been a while since I, since I dug in at a deep level on this, but it doesn't sound like the fundamental uncertainties have yet been fully resolved on site amplification. And I'm wondering then if you carry those uncertainties through the fragility analysis, which is, this is a new, a new part and, and well outside my technical expertise. I was wondering whether those uncertainties were carried through the fragility analysis to be sure that something else didn't happen if we assumed a very different amount of site amplification. Yeah, so um, regarding the, your 3D velocity modeling, an attempt was made at that, um, but it was ultimately not, we weren't confident in the results. Um, and so that's one of the, our tasks in the future is to refine that and really better understand how the 3D velocity structure relates to the amplification because you're correct. You know, the, the process of using the smoothing that, um, of 1D models versus the smoothing of a 3D spatial model or spatial smoothing of a 3D model are going to be different phenomena. Right. Um, and then, you know, what sort of amplifications we're seeing if, um, you know, sir, if you can go back to the FERS slide, that might be representative. You know, the velocity contrasts beneath Diablo Canyon, while being very variable, they're not, there's not a high velocity gradient. And so even though the different structures are located in different places, we're not seeing significantly different furs um, between, say, the auxiliary and containment building. You see differences more between the turbine and containment and auxiliary due to different elevations. Um, but this would give you some idea of the effect of that 3D variability on the ground motions that we're predicting. And, so and Bruce, that's slide 13. Yeah, slide 13, sorry. Okay, and again, I'm having just a little trouble keeping up with it, but, but for instance, as I, just off the top of my head, as I remember, we were thinking that the, slight, the site amplification may be uncertain by a factor of two, if I remember correctly. Mm -hmm. And the question is, if you ran that through the fragility analysis at yeah. At, a, at twice the expected acceleration, what does that do to your fragility analysis? Yeah. I don't know that we've done I that I don't think analysis. we have an answer to that question. Yeah. Um, and, yeah. Okay, well that's it, and I'll, I'll yield the floor, but those were, those were my recollections from the last time IPRP really dug in on this. Great, thanks Bruce. Um, other questions from the phone lines? Okay, then I guess, um, thank you, Nose Art, Albert, Nathan. And um, I guess we'll move to now Stu Nishenko, who's going to give us an update of the 2017 long-term seismic plan. I know at our last meeting, I think we talked about the 2016 update, and now we're on to 2017. So Stu, I'll thank let you, you kick Valerie. that Valerie. So this is a, uh, a process that we've established now over the last two years to kind of provide everyone with. Oh, can we move it? Oh. Okay. Yeah. okay. So, all right, thank you. So, 
what we have tried to do for the last two years now is just provide an update of activities that we have conducted under a long-term seismic program for the benefit of the IPRP as a way to capture uh, the breadth and depth of our activities. And as Nozar had mentioned in, in his talk, the, uh, the LTSP was established in the early 1980s as part of a licensing condition for Diablo Canyon. And then in 1991, PG&E made a commitment to continue the long-term seismic program through a uh, maintaining a group of engineers, scientists, seismologists, and others to stay abreast of new developments in engineering and science as it could possibly be related to Diablo Canyon so that we always have the latest information at hand, as well as to monitor the area around the plant for earthquakes. And you'll see later on we've, ex we've expanded that uh, definition. So now we also monitor ground motion as well as earthquakes. Um, we've touched on this a little bit. The uh, activities, the LTSP, as I said before, to do seismic geodetic monitoring, seismic source characterization, as well as ground motion characterization, and we'll touch on each one of these bullets through the presentation this afternoon. A large part of the conversation we've already had this afternoon is focused on uncertainties, and this tornado diagram is, is a graphical way to illustrate the effect of uncertainty in various parameters that we consider in our hazard analysis on the hazard itself. So a lot of the work that was conducted under the AB 1632 program that the IPRP is well aware of successfully reduced a lot of the uncertainty in those parameters and the impact on um, eventual hazards. So work that we've done in determining the, the slip rate for the Hosbury Fault Zone offshore, which is the primary driver for hazard at Diablo Canyon. Uh, as well as get a better understanding about what the relationship between the shoreline and the Hosbury Fault is, what the slip rate on the Hosbury Fault, all these geologic parameters. We've improved our understanding and reduced uncertainty through um, the work that we've done in AP 1632. And a lot of that has come from the 3D seismic reflection profiling that Sam Blakesley encouraged us to do about 10 years ago. Still on the top though, as you can see from the, the width of, of the various symbols, there's a lot left to do with respect to the ground motion parameters and inputs to that modeling. And this is what we are currently concerned with and we will talk about later in this presentation. The next slide, page four, again, just goes through, I think we've seen this in Nozar's presentation, but the components, the hazard, looking at ground motion, and here we take the median values for source, path, and site effects and their uncertainties. And as I just said before, we feel that we've significantly reduced the uncertainties associated with a lot of the, the source characterization or the, the basic geology, the fault geology associated with uh, these hazards at the plant. Uh, do you want to say something about ergodic versus non-ergodic, Albert? Sure. One of the topics while we're talking about large picture um, is we're going to talk about ergodic versus non-ergodic models for ground motion. In statistical framework, an ergodic model is one that trades space for time. Uh, and so when we talk about earthquakes, we're talking about using global data sets to define earthquake ground motion at a specific location. Uh, we use ergodic, ergodic models because there's a limited availability of earthquake data. So we need to look across the globe to look at earthquake characteristics and then apply those locally. Um, in doing so, we add uncertainty because earthquakes in Taiwan or Japan may not be the same as earthquakes off Diablo Canyon. Um, so recognizing that, we're moving towards a partially non-ergodic model. In a partially non-ergodic model, you have components that are ergodic that use global data sets, but you also have non-ergodic components that use data sets that are developed locally. Um, and here locally may mean at Diablo Canyon or in California. Um, and that scale of localize, localization uh, depends on the, bear, the parameter of interest. Uh, so again, we're using local information to refine the estimates and uncertainty of the ground motion. And the resulting uncertainty of that ground motion really depends on the availability of data. 
areas with data that have a lot of dense data, they're going to have less uncertainty, and areas without data are going to have more uncertainty. And so we'll talk about um, advancements or um, directions in both ergodic and non-ergodic research. Okay. Then. <laughs> uh, and let's talk about um, the general concept of how LTSP performs research. And um, one of the topics that was high in the tornado plot was path effects. Um, when we look at refining our estimate of path effects for Diablo Canyon, um, we're going to follow this flow chart. Um, and this flow chart really applies to other topics as well. If we start in the upper left, we are, need to collect information, um, uh, data from uh, recordings, develop velocity models, things like this. Part of that data could be instrumentation efforts. And all of this gets aggregated together into a model development process. This model is then fed into 3D finite fault simulations that have to go through some sort of validation exercise. And this feeds back into the model development. Um, we then use these uh, outputs from the simulations to look at path effects and inform our uh, uh, path effects models that we use in our hazard analysis. Um, all of this is sort of interact the interaction between the 3D simulations validation and model. We have a, an understanding of physics that's sort of governing the uh, the under the fundamental. Uh, decisions that we're making so that all the models are physics based and therefore can extrapolate where we don't really have all of the data we need. Um, and we try to use a similar process of collecting data, going through an iterative process of model development and validation, and then finally application um, with having a physics informed process rather than just a regression, regression model. Okay. Next slide, slide seven. So, um Line now. So I was just going to break in now, and as Albert was saying, that the research strategy starts on the left with the collection of data and new instrumentation. So we spend a little bit of time just reviewing some of our data and instrumentation activities. This is uh, a deck board photograph of a recovery of some of our ocean bottom seismometers. I think this was May of last year. Um, with Jeff Bachhuber here in the forefront. So the seismic network, one of the licensing conditions that we agreed to was to run a seismograph network in the Central Coast region to keep an eye on earthquake activity here in the area in and around the Diablo Canyon. That network is installed in 1987. It currently consists of 15 digital three-component stations that themselves are comprised of velocity sensors that stay on scale for earthquakes less than magnitude three and then acceleration sensors that will stay on scale for earthquakes greater than magnitude three. So the idea here is that we can uh, record on scale for a wide range of earthquakes and get as much information as we can from those events. This network shown here by the, the red squares complements the existing USGS network, which you could barely see it, but are the, the triangles that exist along the coastal region and then towards the Central Valley here in this inset photograph. So we work collaboratively, collaboratively with the USGS to try to provide uniform coverage of the Central California region. Our data is telemetered to San Francisco and then shared with the USGS as well as the Northern California Seismic Network. Uh, in 2017, overall, there have been about 400 earthquakes that have been recorded in this area of magnitudes ranging from zero to about magnitude four, just as an idea about activity. And that number varies from year to year. Uh, I think the average number is about five or 600 events. So in addition to monitoring earthquakes, we also collaborate with the USGS to uh, monitor geodesy or ground deformation in the area. And this was an activity that was started in 2003 following the San Simeon earthquake. And we've been uh, working with them since. There are currently nine sites as shown by these symbols on the map where there is either continuous or semi-continuous GPS monitoring in the area. 
And then again, these data are archived at the Northern California Earthquake Data Center. So together, the seismic data and the geodetic data allow us to uh, construct a more informed model of current tectonic deformation in the central coastal California area. As part of the AB 1632 program, we installed a series of ocean bottom seismometers on the continental shelf. Let's get back here. Here we go. Offshore Diablo Canyon. So Diablo is right here, and the continental shelf is about coincident with the three mile uh, California state water limits. But we had a series of four ocean bottom instruments that we had put out there with the purpose of improving earthquake detection, earthquake location, and association of earthquakes with known geologic faults, and then also constraints on focal mechanisms to get a better idea of exactly what kind of faulting was occurring in the area. Was it strike-slip faulting, reverse faulting, normal faulting? One of the, uh, the issues that we encountered when we started doing this in 2008 eight when the, uh, the shoreline fault zone, for instance, was first identified, was that there was a lot of uncertainty as to the actual location of the epicenters due to the fact that all the stations that were used to locate the offshore earthquakes were located onshore. So there's a natural bias. You didn't have offshore coverage. So the, the location uncertainties were perpendicular to the coast, reflecting the station bias. We thought we could uh, address that bias by putting instruments offshore and, in essence, surrounding the earthquake, the locations of the earthquakes of interest, which at that time were the shoreline and Hosgrey Faults. There are two generations of ocean bottom seismometers that were uh, deployed. One was a cabled network, and I'll show you a picture of that in a second, which ran from 2013 to 14, and then an autonomous network which ran from 2014 to 2017. In November 2017, we, uh, we discontinued operation of that network. So this is a picture of the two different kinds of OBS instruments. The cabled array is on the left, the autonomous on the right. The primary difference between the two is the cabled array instruments themselves are within this one-ton concrete dome. And are directly, if you will, hardwired to shore via a cable. The autonomous array, on the other hand, by its name is autonomous. These are much smaller instruments which sit by themselves on the seafloor, have a, their lifetime on the seafloor is dictated by the battery life, which is about six months. So it requires us to go twice a year to recover the instruments, um, get the data that they may have recorded, as well as recharge the battery. The cabled array is originally designed was to be located on the shelf for up to 10 years with power and data being transmitted all the time through a hardwired cable so you wouldn't have to come back and retrieve the instruments on a regular basis. Unfortunately, the cabled array didn't perform as to scope as originally defined and that's why we uh, use the autonomous array for four years from 13, excuse me, from 14 to 17, just to continue our evaluation of what the size of the city was on the continental shelf region. So in our program review for the OBS program, we, we considered environmental effects, instrument effects, as well as the quality of the earthquake locations and coming up with this decision whether to continue or discontinue the program. And, and the environmental side, the continental shelf, is, is a rather narrow, um, about three miles wide, but it's a rather shallow zone, which is impacted by winter storms, um, and also uh, the instruments themselves that were on the seafloor had issues with seafloor coupling. In other words, how soundly is a seismometer coupled to the ground itself? The one-ton caps provided good coupling, hence good transmission of vibrations of the ground to the instruments, where the lighter autonomous instruments, a lot of times, they weren't very well coupled. So as a result, the records were noisy. Instruments tended to move around during winter storms and were affected by um, currents and waves throughout the year. So uh, 
for that reason, the, uh, the lighter instruments, while, we're, while they're valuable for short time periods, for a long uh, term commitment did not meet the goals that we had originally identified. The same thing with instrumentation, again, the, uh, the autonomous instruments need to, their battery life is only six months, so you're constantly going back and recharging the battery. And because nothing is connected to the shore via hardwire connection, uh, timing corrections are always uncertain. So when you put down an instrument and then you, you set the time via GPS clock and then go and you retrieve the instrument, you look at the time and recalibrate it against the GPS time. There's always an offset in time. And the question is, is that offset linear with time or is it somehow cyclical? And the best thing you can do is kind of connect the two dots at the beginning and the end of the deployment, which in this case is over six months, and interpolate what that clock correction could be. We're in the business of, you know, now locating earthquakes where milliseconds makes a big difference in where the earthquake locations are, the epicenters and hypocenters. So having clock errors on the order of milliseconds can be uh, detrimental. How much is over six months? Is it milliseconds? Yeah. Yeah, Seven and it could be tens to hundreds, depending. Oh, it could be up to, say, 100 milliseconds, something like that. Yeah. So, uh, so this becomes a significant issue, and again, you don't have a way to check on it. But of course, you may have some onshore recordings of some of those to anger to. Well, we did, and as part of the evaluation of earthquake locations, the third bullet, we looked at locations with just onshore recordings sure. and lo locations with onshore and offshore yeah, recordings. And a lot of times, it improved the depth control because you're closer to the epicenter. Right and within one depth distance. So a lot of times we improve the depth, we improve the focal mechanisms, but many times not necessarily the locations. So from a cost benefit point of view, given the fact that we had to go out twice a year to conduct this work and it's more expensive to maintain an ocean bottom network than it is to maintain an on land network, we decided that given the outcome of the earthquakes that we did record. So in 2014 to 2017, there were only 17 events recorded offshore in that area that we had for analysis. So it's a very low activity environment. And then given the problems we have logistics and operations, we decided that it was appropriate to discontinue the operations for right now. So the instruments were uh, recovered in November 17, and now they're sitting in a warehouse waiting future disposition. Moving on. Um, one of the new initiatives that we're looking into, again, to reduce uncertainty and to add to our understanding of path effects and ground motions is <coughs> our smart meter program. And perhaps, Katie, do you want to say a word too about the smart meter program? Can I move the mic closer? Uh, so this is Katie Waddell, who's uh, spearheading that initiative. Okay, so our smart meter program. So in the, in the bottom picture here, you can see an array of our smart meters. And that little glass bubble is what you can pull out of the smart meters. And on our next generation smart meter, we're going to be including um, an accelerometer chip. So a picture of the chip is right up there and it's going to fit into that little glass insert. Um, we currently have about 10 million smart meters. We're starting with the electric smart meters putting this chip in. We have somewhere between five and six million of these things in our service territory. And what that chip's going to do is it's going to allow us to turn our smart meters into one of the densest seismic networks probably in the world. Um, we're committed to customer safety or customer privacy. It's one of our main concerns with this program. So we will not be releasing, we don't plan to be releasing um, individual recordings from individual locations. The plan is to then aggregate the data over maybe a square mile or a city block. We're working through the details. So we'll be stacking those instruments or those recordings together. It will um, improve the signal to noise ratio. Um, the signal um, and then we can use those records to study things, path effects um, and understand where the strong shaking has occurred after an earthquake. 
Um, the deployment schedule, we don't have control over the deployment, so that new accelerometer will go into the next generation meter, and as the company rolls it out, we'll start to have access to the um, different, different um, meters um, and start recording data. Um, yeah? Great. Great. Just a quick question. Yes. What's, what's the broad time frame for deployment? Chuck, do you know those details? It could be decades. Yeah, it's it's going <laughs> to um, be a while. Yeah, looking at the rollout when PG&E's replaced past smart meters, it could be on the order of thousands of units to tens of thousands of units a year type of schedule. Okay. And so that's still up in the air. We are looking, though, at some electric vehicle charging stations. And those could be a good candidate for the initial application. Those are spread out throughout the state. And so that will be a good, at least initial test. How are these working? What kind of data are we recovering? And, and this is Bruce Gibson. Could I ask a, a couple of questions about that as well? <laughs> Actually, one question and a, and a comment. Um, so these, if, if they go in smart meters, those things are hung on the side of the house. Does, does the, the, the structural, does the response, the spectral response of that structure mess with the recording you get in terms of actual ground motion? Yes, so um, the, the meters are about three to four feet in the air. We've done some testing on it and we're showing that these meters up to about 10 hertz um, record um, pretty consistently with what we would see on the ground motion. And so we think that we can use that for um, looking at structural response. And then, and then the, the other one's more of a comment just in terms of the public outreach on that. I, 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 th I think many of you know I'm a county supervisor here in San Luis Obispo County, and when the initial run of smart meters rolled out, there was tremendous pushback by certain members of the public over their privacy, over their exposure to electromagnetic uh, uh, radiation. And if you're putting a black chip into somebody's smart meters, you might want to get with your public relations folks on how you ex explain that to the public. I would, I would caution against doing it without explaining it to the public, because if it came, came out, you'll probably have a considerable amount of, of public concern uh, raised, just from the experience of the initial smart meter rollout. Well, sure. we'll, we'll yeah, go ahead, Jeff. Yeah, so thank you. That's a good comment. Uh, we have been working with the Law Department of Public Relations in preparation of this coming out. Yeah. Um, as Katie mentioned, we will be bundling the data. Uh, but with regard to having a new instrument, let's say, in their smart meter, there are other elements also besides this accelerometer, uh, much greater uh, definition of power pulses, things such as that. So there's a whole bunch of uh, different capabilities that will be coming out with the new next generation so, smart meter. So just, just I'll, I'll, let, I'll let it go with this comment. The initial smart meter, I think people didn't see what was in it for the individual customer. Mm -hmm. It was clear that it benefited PG&E because you didn't have to have meter readers running around. An accelerometer in there that leads to some kind of seismic safety benefit for the public, and that's just speaking to the technical experts there, it might be a good message to point out why wh why it's good for the public that we have accelerometers in every in every smart meter, because uh, the real sense is that 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 the that the individual customer was not benefiting any, any like uh, at all relative to PG and E's benefits. Yeah, right. so and, and excellent comments. Well, yeah. and and I think though since we've had smart meters for like the last ten years that we are seeing benefits in terms of actually metering energy efficiency savings and other parts of the business that we have better information. So um, I think we've come a long way in the last 10 years, Bruce, and we certainly appreciate the feedback and hope that we don't have uh, the similar uh, public outreach issues as we deploy the next generation of smart yeah. meters. So it's all self-serving because I, I have to answer the question, or my staff has to answer to the question when it rolls out in our neighborhood. So yeah, that's good. Yeah, so and there you. will be capabilities for the customer to talk to the smart meters themselves. And so they'll be able to pull off information such as what particular equipment 
is you know pulling the greatest amount of power, things such as that. So there will be, I think, a more visible benefit to the customer than potentially the last version of smart well, meters. Actually, Jeff, a lot of that information is currently available to customers through the green button program that's part of our energy efficiency platform. We also have other ways to share that interval meter data. A customer can choose sure. to do that yep. with a third party through share my data. So I think customers, there, there are some customers who have really embraced mm -hmm. the information that's available from the current generation of smart meters. And I think we'll probably continue to see that um, with the next generation too. Great. Great. Okay, Bob? Yeah, I'll do. I had a, I, I dug into this a year or two ago and I remembered the, the answer that you gave about the frequency response uh, was, was jives with my memory. That is, it's not going to be an accurate um, measure of the ground motion at, at 25 hertz, but that's not the big deal because we're really looking at the, well, at lower. Um, that doesn't bother me, but I have a, uh, I have a, um, a suggestion. That is that you're forced to aggregate because you don't want to invade people's privacy. But you know, if you ask me, I would, I, I and my wife, I am sure, would let you invade, invade my privacy. I have no problem with, I have no problem with you're publishing my name, my address, and my ground motion. And all you need is 1% of the people to agree to that, and you've got a much better network for that 1% than you do for the others, because you don't have to aggregate. And it but seems to me that you might think about that, and I made that suggestion to, to a pg and &E meeting, I don't know, a couple years ago, but I'm not sure where it went. Mm -hmm. uh, the second thing is, that for somebody like me, I would give you permission to put in, uh, maybe you only have to do one, you know, one in a hundred, because after all that, that turns out to be 10,000 instead of a million, right? It's still a lot. Uh, a different sensor on my house that uh, <coughs> had, had, had more, um, more dynamic range and so on than the thing that you're forced to put in because you're going to have to put in what five million of them or whatever the numbers are a million of them. and it seems to me that you might think about asking a subset to uh, give the, give permission to put in not only to use the specific site but to put in a more uh, 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 a um, a system with more dynamic range because boy you'd like to have that. I mean, that, uh, if I was, I'm not a seismologist, but I'm acting like one. It well, would, it, would, it would seem to me that that would be really useful. It is. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the USGS has uh, developed a program called NetQuakes, yeah, where they're that, right. doing exactly that. They're letting uh, individuals allow the USGS to install instruments on their property, which saves them a lot of money having to uh, not go through permitting and, and that whole process. Right, but you see, but you're doing it already and you're going to have the transmission capability and so it's all there. It's just put in a different gadget than the one you're other. And, and some of these things I think are important from, you know, what's the utilities core responsibility and are there easy features that we can do versus what's really, you know, USGS's responsibility as well. So um, I, I, I think trying to administer a site-specific program through a smart meter with all of the privacy issues, um, with 20 million customers, okay. could be a bit challenging, and I don't know that we get better information than the USGS is getting through their site-specific program. But we certainly partner with USGS on a number of things, and it's certainly something that if there's a partnership opportunity, we can explore that. This step in the right direction. Mm -hmm. And by the way, let me just say one more thing about explaining the benefit. It's transparent. I'm going to explain the benefit to you. We have a son that lives only a few blocks away. When we get a little one, earthquake, we always call him up and say, did you feel it? And half the time he doesn't. It's only a few blocks away. And he'll call us up and say, did you feel it? We said no, half the time. It's highly local. That's exactly what this network is intended to learn about. Now you can explain to an average citizen, householder, that because it's highly local, we would all like to know whether your house and its neighbors is in this or this or this environment. That's something that is in the interest of the homeowner. And that's easy to explain because everybody has the experience of how local it is because they see their neighbors and you feel it. No, I didn't feel it, but I felt it. So everybody knows it's local, localized. 
40, 50 years ago, we coined the term microzonation. I remember mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. exactly that point, and now we have reached the point that we can actually start can tackling that problem. We can do it, yeah. right. Yeah. And, right. And again, a lot of the information, it sounds like it will be aggregated by zip code, where you know there's certain PUC privacy rules that you have to have at least you know X number of residences and be able to aggregate it, and then that can be provided publicly. My zip code has 20,000 so, people. So, but it, it's still it's still um, going to be better than what's there currently. So, um, I think it's a step in the right direction. But appreciate the feedback on some possible refinements. Valerie, mm -hmm. uh, I just want to say something as a private citizen, not as a PG&E representative. I was talking as one too. Okay, uh, I I have heard about this, and I've actually heard through kind of public channels. There's a concern in the public as far as what it would do to their earthquake insurance. And if suddenly your microzone, that your house gets bigger earthquakes than people a block away, <laughs> farmers are going to come say, oh, we're going to double your rates. <laughs> so there are people I know who are afraid of that. I want to know that. Uh, I would like to know it as a seismic engineer. But what is an insurance Mm. Well, an I I interesting perspective. So as you see, you know, that, that's part of the, you know, in, in, a, in a modern society, everyone sees different risk and benefits. So thank you for that feedback. And now you understand some of the challenges we face as you try to run a regulated utility. <laughs> but thank you. <laughs> Okay. Um, Let's continue. Well, okay. Well, well. Before we we go on, just any <laughs> other points from the phone or other folks on on that uh, new functionality. Okay. Back to Stu. All Thank right. you. An exciting future <laughs> lies ahead. So, next thing I like to do is spend a couple of minutes <coughs> focusing on seismic source characterization, something near and dear to my heart. And, you know, as part of the AB 1632 program, we had made a commitment that all the information and data that we had collected would be publicly available. Uh, the onshore seismic reflection data is currently residing in IRIS database, and all the marine seismic reflection data is currently sitting at the National Archive of Marine Seismic Data, so is freely available to the scientific community to use. And a little later on, I'll show you an example of what the USGS has been doing with 3D data that we've collected uh, offshore on the Hosby Fault. But this slide here just kind of gives you a little bullet list of some of the projects that we're currently working on related to seismic source characterization. And I was going to focus on those that are bold faced um, to just bring, give you an update. In principle, all of these are being developed for publication and peer review journals. So again, this is our contribution, our contribution to the legacy uh, and just the general understanding and knowledge about geology and tectonics in the Central California coast. The first bullet, because it came up a little earlier in the conversation, development of an alternate model to explain uplift of the Irish Hills. We had uh, talked about in the last IPRP meeting that we had in 2017, uh, and in a nutshell, previous models had uh, been developed using what we call rigid block models. In this particular study, we're using uh, an updated, more modern viscoelastic model to see if we can use the compression that's occurring across the Hosby Fault to, in fact, explain the two-tenths of a millimeter uplift of the Irish Hills as evidenced by the marine terraces that you see uh, along the coastline here. So this is something that's currently in review of the Journal of Geophysical Research. Uh, the next two bullet items uh, have to do with the 3D seismic reflection mapping that we did offshore, one in San Luis Obispo Bay, and the other one to the south, near Point South, focusing on the Hosgrave Fault Zone. So this is a, an illustration from our so shoreline fault zone paper, where we were able to image a set of uh, paleo shorelines, you can kind of see this here at the bottom, in, in 3D, and actually see an offset of one of those paleo shorelines by the shoreline fault zone. So this shoreline is a little nick that you can see in the uninterpreted panel, and next to it is the interpreted panel. It's about nine plus or minus six meters. 
and from that NIC and our estimate about what the age of this particular feature is, we're coming up with slip rate for the shoreline fault zone of about 0.05 to 0.09 millimeters a year, or 50 to 90 microns per year. Again, relatively small level of activity compared to the, the Hosby fault, which is moving on the order of one to two millimeters a year. So, but this, for the first time, actually gave us some empirical evidence to uh, identify what the slip rate is for that particular feature. And this is an article that's currently in review of the Bulletin of Seismological Society of America. This slide, number 17, just uh, restates some of those results. <coughs> and what we were able to do, too, the area that we had uh, surveyed in detail clearly imaged a six and a half kilometer long section of the shoreline fault zone in the middle of San Luis Obispo Bay. And then connecting that with <coughs> work that we did in uh, prior pg e studies now, we've managed to increase the overall length of the shoreline fault zone from Point Bichon all the way down to Point Sal for uh, an estimated length now of about 45 kilometers. Is, is the shoreline... Uh, so it's a strike-slip fault, and then we go back right, to this. Is it purely vertical? I mean, how no, it's purely strike-slip. There's maybe a 10 to 1 ratio oh, so of, it's a sort of ten, horizontal it has vertical. A horizontal vertical, about 10 to 1. Yeah. Okay. So, so this has a, has a little bit. A little bit. Okay. And just right at the limit of resolution. Okay. So by virtue of the fact now that we've increased the length of the shoreline fault zone to 45 kilometers, then We've also increased the maximum magnitude of an earthquake that would be limited to the length of the shoreline fault zone to about magnitude 6.7. Um, while we see evidence of Pleistocene activity on the shoreline fault zone, there is, right now is equivocal evidence of Holocene activity, that is earthquake activity within the last 10,000 years. A lot of this has to do with just technique the, uh, the high resolution seismic data that we collected still only has about two to three meters of acoustic resolution based on uh, the equipment that we're using and the fact that we have relatively low slip rates. Again, we're talking about hundreds of a millimeter a year. So those earthquakes may take on the order of 10 to 20,000 years to recur. So this is longer than the period of the Holocene. Uh, further. Yes. Um, who's the first author on that manuscript? I am. You are. Okay. So I know who to vote. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. <laughs> we need to call data for our database. And we're, we will distribute preprints of that once okay. we, uh, we get it through the read process of right. the SSA, as we will all the studies that we've mentioned in the annual report. We want to provide you with update. Uh, a little further south, we're, we're uh, in the process again of updating and reviewing the work that we did on the Hosby Fault Zone. This bench diagram uh, actually comes from some work that the U.S. Geological Survey down in Santa Cruz has done with our data looking at fluid flow in the Hosby Fault Zone itself. So over in this back panel here, what they've seen is evidence within the fault zone of what they call chimney zones and bright spots. And these are areas in the seismic section where you can actually see gas migrating to the surface as well as fluid. So this kind of gives you an idea of just the unprecedented quality of the data that we've been able to collect using 3D techniques. And what we'll be doing with this now is looking at offset uh, paleo channels that cross the Hosby Fault and use that to estimate what the slip rate for the Hosby Fault is in the area of adjacent to Point Sal. Again, these are some of the first estimates of fault slip rate for both the shoreline and the Hosby Fault Zone in the marine environment. The only other estimates that we have for the Hosby are a little bit further north in Estero Bay and near San Simeon on shore. Though again, uh, these are big improvements in reducing the uncertainty for these faults, which as you saw in the earlier slide, control the seismic hazard in the Diablo Canyon area. <clears throat> now, one of the, the thing that's also come out of the work that we've done for AB 1632 is that all of this data that we've collected now it really has to be regarded as legacy data, primarily because the opportunity 
for collecting additional seismic reflection data like this is, I think, rather limited given the concern about sound in the sea and just uh, environmental concerns. So data that we've collected, data that the USGS collected as part of the California State Waters Program is all, you know, to be uh, archived and cherished as much as possible because we may not be getting more data in the future. Bob. Um, you want to speak to what you know about the Hosbury uh, uh, as to whether it's a stationary Poisson or, or, or as opposed to episodic? No. Thank you. Hmm? It's, it's, we have not addressed that point yeah. as of yet, so I'm not prepared to talk about it. But, but, but you've been talking for a while about it's going to be in your program along the way. By the way, the point is, just to, the jargon I was using was, the question is whether the probability per year is uniform over, the, over time or the probability per year changes uh, episodically. I mean, that, that's a stationary Poisson process is one in which it's an equal probability every year. It's cyclic or it's stationary, right? Yeah. And on land, places like the San Andreas Fault, what you would do is you would excavate the fault. You yeah, know, I understand. You're, you're, stuck, you're stuck with that. You can't do that. Well, mm -hmm. we can't do that offshore. Right. So that's being able to address whether this is, is a random process or a cyclical process um, as of this point, I can't say. You can bound it, certainly, by making those assumptions and making assumptions about the coefficient of variation in the whole. The big right. advancement that we've made with the work here is that we finally come up with defensible estimates of what the slip rate was. Okay, but again, these are long-term slip rates where you're looking at offset features that are you know, that's a long hundreds of thousands that's of right. years old. Over many, many. But between successive earthquake ruptures, we don't have that level of resolution right now to address that question like you did if you had a paleo seismic site on the San Andreas. Or any of the, or any, any, any of them that are onshore, actually. Right. right. So this, this is a limitation of marine work, but, you know, with time. Okay. Well, but Stu, would you say that, I think we've talked in previous IPRP meetings that, uh, you know, there has been a lot of work done to constrain that seismic source characterization. So, you know, some of these additional things might, you know, might yield some additional knowledge, but might not help further constrain well, but that. There's a bound, Stu, will tell you, but it's not useful enough yet. Yeah, it's still bounding. And, you know, okay, so let me go back to this slide. Mm -hmm. The tornado fly has them. One of the, okay, so one of the, the constraints that we had to deal with, okay, is that we have unprecedented spatial resolution of the offsets of these faults based on the 3D seismic work that we've done. However, the temporal resolution on when those offsets occurred is, is not as well constrained. So we had to make a number of assumptions that uh, Tim will see in the paper when he reads it about what are the age of these features that are offset by the faulting. So we don't have a particular age. We can go out and do a radiocarbon date get an age and then develop your calculations on that. But I could say that this feature is somewhere between 100,000 and 600,000 years old. So that gives me a range, and that range may be on the order of a factor of four or five in slip rate, which again is significantly better than saying, well, either I don't know or it's a factor of 10 range. So we're gradually being able to narrow it down but at least now, too, because we've done this work, we know exactly where to look. So in the future, if we come up with better techniques and, and procedures, uh, and somebody wants to get a better understanding of that rate, they know where to look, because we've mapped it out. So again, it's, it's a gradual progression of knowledge and process. Does that help, Bob? Yeah, I mean, yeah, obviously, just to ask the layman's question. Sure. I want to know what the, whether the annual probability in the next 10 or 20 years is the 100,000 year average or different. Sure. That, uh, by the way, I, right? That's what we want to know. You know. But by comparison between no, shoreline fault zone. We know a lot more than we used to. Go ahead. That's right. Mm -hmm. and, and so one of the things we do know now is just by virtue of the difference in slip rates is that the Hosby fault zone is a much more active Right. fault in the shoreline fault zone. Yeah, for sure. 
by maybe about an order of 100. So we've made progress. So getting back to this bench diagram, we're going to try to, we will do the same kind of analysis on the Hosby fault offshore points out and look at offset geometric features to get better constraints again on <coughs> what the slip rate of the Hosby fault zone is in that environment. Um, so we were talking about legacy data. So one of the things that we're doing with the USGS is working with them to process or what we call post-process the data that we've collected to uh, put it in its best form possible because this is going to be a legacy product for for decades to come and uh, the next slide here just kind of gives you a an example of the kind of things that you can do to seismic data to improve or sharpen the image and the clarity everywhere from removing uh, the swell or the wavy the wave noise that is apparent in seismic data as you collect it from the surface and remove what we call multiples or echoes from some of the, um, the underlying strata to, again, improve the quality of the data. So this is something that we've done with the USGS, and uh, they've also employed these techniques in a lot of the 3D data that we've collected as well. These data sets are publicly available, and the URLs to those data sets are shown in the annual report. So again, this is part of our commitment to, uh, to maintain um, high quality data for the Central Coast as part of the, the activities that we've been doing for the last decade. And with that, I'll hand it off to um, Albert, but just in closing, saying that you know, we do and will continue to uh, develop a lot of the data sets that were uh, reported on in our report to the I IPRP in 2014 and put it in the peer review literature so it's more widely available to the scientific community. Thank you, Stu. So it's three o'clock, and I'm gonna, so I'm gonna try and move through these quickly. Stop me if you have questions, and we can go in in detail, but I'll try and finish this up in the next 15 minutes or something like that. So that's why I'm going fast. So um, I talked about ergodic and non-ergodic ground motion models, um, and I wanna talk to, you, talk to you about a little of the research that we've done in 2017 on these ground motion models, and additionally some other um, research activities we've worked on. Uh, we've, um, so ergodic ground motion models, we're using global data sets. Um, one of those activities was development and validation of the SCEC, that Southern California Earthquake Center kinematic broadband platform. Um, we also looked at validation of Fourier amplitude spectra from simulations um, for structural sp response analyses. Um, and I'm going to go into those in detail here in a moment. We also look at dynamic rupture models based off of and, uh, simulations and looked at some workshops and planning for future research tasks in this area. Look at development of site attenuation parameters um, and how we, how we need to refine our scaling methodologies that we're using for those. Uh, look at guidelines for characterizing hard rock, hard rock site conditions using surface waves um, so we can have a uniform approach uh, for using surface waves. Uh, funding of the geotechnical array out of uh, UC Santa Barbara uh, for collecting near surface site effects to understand the attenuation properties near surface. And finally, expanding empirical databases for use in developing er ergodic ground motion models. Uh, a little bit about the SCEC broadband platform, val broadband platform validation exercise. Um, the broadband platform provides a verified and validated computational environment for earthquake simulation. Um, previously, this platform was validated against seven earthquakes that were based on similar, simple planar geometries. Um, and now we want to take the platform and use it for more, more complicated ruptures. But before we do that, we need to validate that the, the platform and the um, way that we're modeling the fault is appropriate. Um, so we're using 13 more complicated multi-segment earthquakes and looking at how simulations compare to observed ground motions. And, all, and by improving uh, or going through this ver verification and validation exercise, it's going to improve our ability uh, and confidence in the simulations, or improves our ability to simulate and improves our confidence in the results. When we take simulated earthquake ground motions, we also want to make sure that, that the time series that we get out of them um, are appropriate for use in analysis. And so this exercise of validation of the Fourier amplitude spectra from simulations um, was done to look at the 
correlation structure of the time series and the Fourier amplitude spectra to look at how the correlation structure from simulated and recorded ground motions differ. Um, what was observed was that the correlation structure in simulated ground motions was more correlated than that of observed ground motions. Um, and, or sorry, simulations were less correlated than the observed ground motions, and less correlation imparts less structural demand on systems. So if you use simulated ground motions currently, they're going to result in lower structural demands than if you were to use similar observed ground motions. Um, and so before we can start really using simulated ground motions for structural analysis, we need to um, identify these, the causes of these shortcomings and, and address them. In the realm of non-ergodic ground motion models, we worked on development of a ground motion model for California that encompasses, encompasses this idea of continuous regionalization. So that is, now we have, um, and next bullet down, and on the line, we're on slide 24, by the way. Um, development of spatial correlation models for California path effects, um, which sort of feeds back into the continu continuous re regionalization model. Uh, we also are looking at building a new 3D crustal model for Central California. Um, and this involves collection and processing of seismic data, and then improving the velocity model using 3D tomography. Uh, we're, looking, we're running 3D simulations for path effects in California, and identifying differences um, between observed and predicted path effects. We're developing new methods and data for constraining path effects uh, in our ground motion models um, and evaluating updated CyberShake, um, which is a, a platform at SCEC simulations for uh, path effects. And finally, a uh, USGS workshop on developing velocity models for strong ground motion modeling. If we talk about spatial correlation models here for a moment, in a typical ground motion prediction equation, we have coefficients that are typically period dependent. As we start looking at spatial correlation, now we're gonna have uh, parameters that now are gonna vary uh, across a spatial area, such as California. Each little cell is going to have a different coefficient. Uh, using the NGA West 2 database, um, we developed a, non, a partially non-ergodic model for California with non-ergodic terms for source um, a cell specific path attenuation and VS30 scaling that is again um, cell specific. Coefficients are computed for a range of periods and a manuscript is under preparation for um, uh, documenting this effort. Um, that's in ground motion space. If we start thinking about in simulation space um, and forward prediction using um, simulations, we're also trying to improve our crustal model. Um, so we're using SCEC simulations using 3D tomography models. Um, and this is incorporating near surface seismic velocity, basin structures, and fault structures. The output of the um, 3D, um, uh, 3D analyses is then being incorporated by the USGS to integrate constraints from gravimetric, aeromagnetic, and geologic modeling. Um, and so SCEC and USGS are working together to help constrain the, the crustal velocity model. Uh, and this is just more of those details, and we'll skip over that for time. When we have a non-ergodic model with these spatial varying coefficients, we now need software that can incorporate those coefficients into hazard codes, um, so we can look at recomputing hazard for, say, Diablo Canyon. Um, and it's expected that, well, we have one non-ergodic model now, uh, maybe two if, um, that are appropriate for California, the next round of ground motion models will uh, increase the number of non-ergodic models available. Um, so we've developed um, the hazard code that, that we typically use at Diablo Canyon is HAS45, and in the past year we've modified HAS45 to include the ability to use spatially varying coefficients um, that would be present in non-ergodic models. And we're also collaborating with EDF, which is Electricité de France, um, to have OpenQuake modified as well. And so now we're gonna have two, two software um, that can do hazard and then we can compare and validate and make sure that the, they're doing the, the right things. Uh, an exciting area of research that we're embarking on is looking at the testing of hazard using precarious rocks. Um, so here on the right we've got a precariously balanced rock that's located uh, several miles south of Diablo Canyon. Uh, we can test ground motion hazard using geologic features and see if the hazard numbers that we're coming up with can they be constrained based off of these presence of these features? 
Um, if the ground motion is too high, then the rocks should have toppled in the past, and therefore we can say maybe the, those alternatives in the hazard model aren't appropriate, and we can trim those and get a better uh, refinement of hazard. Using this process, we can only pull down the ground motion, um, and uh, uh, it wouldn't provide any information to increase it. Um, the, this process involves developing fragility, so looking probabilities of toppling versus um, specific ground motion parameters. And that's, those fragilities are developed using 3D stability analyses um, using realistic earthquake time series. And then again, we, we use these results to tr trim unrealistic branches of the, of the ground motion hazard. I talked a little bit about non-vibratory ground motion hazards, um, and fault rupture was one of those. Current databases, data sets for fault rupture are rather limited. They've got limited data quality, they are not very complete, and there's not a lot of documentation and metadata to describe other things other than the magnitude and uh, displacement observed. So we can't think about how side effects may be influencing fault rupture. Um, and there's no real physical basis for understanding the scaling of fault rupture mechanics. Um, Additionally, there are statistical methods used to deal with fault rupture haven't really been developed. There's, we've got unequal sampling in geologic uh, observations of fault rupture. We've got bias in sampling. People go out and see fault rupture where it's easy to get to, where the fault rupture is large. Um, and there's also data gaps because you're only sampling um, specific stops on a reconnaissance effort. If we talk about uh, fault rupture off the main trace, so that's secondary fault rupture. There are a few models that uh, allow for us to look at secondary fault rupture. And again, there is no standard software, there's no standard software for computing fault rupture. In 2017, we started on initial work to look at a statistical model for fault rupture, and um, we're working with PEER to develop a large long-term research program to really refine fault rupture hazard. The databases that are available and also the um, models that are going to be available. Uh, and with that, I do scream through those. You did. You did. Yeah. Wow. Thank um, you. That's that. And if there are any questions, let me know. I'd say thanks, uh, Stu and Albert. Um, uh, well, we, I know we already had a lively discussion on the smart meter piece. Any, <laughs> any questions on um, Albert's uh, presentation? Well, this, actually, this is going back to the problem with the risk assessment submittal, and I apologize for not asking earlier. It's kind of my inexperience in these uh, fora. Um, just you measure the seismic impact at the structures in the power block, the turbine containment auxiliary building. It's been mentioned to me that since n now we know which buildings are probably most likely to stick around for a while. That is there a reason not to measure at the ISPACY? It seems like the impact, since that's the structure that's probably going to be sitting there the longest at this stage, um, if we're predicting, it seems like maybe we should be measuring there as well. Is that is there a reason it's not being measured, or is it just is it, or or can it be and it just isn't at the moment? Yeah, the, uh, the SPRA is limited to the operating power plant, basically. Okay. So you're looking at uh, safe shutdown equipment. That was a primary concern. So it was not uh, looking at this facility, per se. But it, I mean, but could it, it could be looked at, sure, definitely. And, and uh, no reason to believe that it's going to be significantly different because uh, We've already compared that to the hospital, and it is in line, and that's what the plan is uh, evaluated for. Yeah, you're right. It's, the reason it's not there because it's not part of the operating plan. Thanks for that feedback. Um, other questions on the phone or in the room? And I think our next agenda item has uh, been focused on publications that are forthcoming. And I think Stu has captured those in his presentation on the LTSP. So as we get preprints of those articles, we'll share them with you. And then I guess that brings us to the open discussion part of the agenda, David. So.
Well, I, I mean, I don't. Kick I mean, it to you. Yeah, there's there's been a lot of good questions already, and we're well past three o'clock, and I'm I'm always a little worried that someone's going to come in and kick us out. I already saw some people kind of peering in the door, but um, you know, if anyone has questions, please feel free to ask them now or forever hold your peace. Okay, and um, well, I don't obviously I don't have a question, but I guess my uh, my one action item from the discussion is to go back and look at those FNOs 20-4, 20-8, 20, 20, 20 11 and I think Bruce's questions on the uncertainty in the site amplification kind of gotten addressed through the discussion on the LTSP and some of the um, the activities there. Did folks have anything else on their question list? Doug, you well, have a question? Uh, questions, could, could a question be a comment? <laughs> sure, go right ahead. Okay, if I could then uh, share some other thoughts with the uh, group here. And that is about the following. Now, based on my nearly 50 years involvement with the Diablo Canyon project, initially as consultant to PG&E and later to the A4NR group, it's my opinion that the SPRA recently submitted by PG&E is based on a grossly inadequate and apparently purposefully misleading seismic source model. This then invalidates the entire following SPRA. The SPRA seismic source model is affected by a series of what I call gorillas in the room issues, identified as follows. The first one, which uh, we've uh, heard uh, some of PG&E's work on, it's the lead 1,000 pound gorilla, is the mechanism of uplift to the Irish Hills to be compared, for example, with the uplift to the adjacent Santa Lucia range during the 2003 San Simeon earthquake which provided a full-scale working analog. Um, regarding the viscoelastic uh, modeling concept, I would note that the uh, Honolulu Tidewater Well is about three kilometers deep, and uh, it seems to have been drilling in brittle rock as far down as it went, as well as the fact that, uh, so far as I can tell, the earthquakes, which are quite abundant beneath both the Irish Hills and the adjacent part of the Los Osos Valley uh, also bespeak a brittle fracture down to depths of uh, between four and about ten kilometers. The following 800-pound gorilla is the lack of consideration of a joint rupture of the shoreline and North Hosgri Faults to be compared with the occurrence during the 2001 Denali earthquake along the Denali Fault and its branch, the Totsuna Fault, which I think can be considered as analog for the Osgri and the um, Charline Fault. The 500-pound gorilla is PG&E's dismissal of any hazard of potential for sympathetic or coextensive surface rupture of the Diablo Cove branch of the Shoreline Fault to be compared with the 60 centimeter surface rupture of the Nunez Fault following the 1984 Koalanga earthquake. The Delbo Cove Fault is Could present in the Unit 1 power block and reactor foundation. Could I ask a question? Were these I, comments? I've only got one point to finish. And oh, okay. I'm All right. Go ahead. Clear. Thank you. Additionally, the apparent absence of any consideration of the 3 to 4, 3.0 to 4.0 PGA and the 1.0 to 20 hertz frequency range during the recent character Christchurch and Kaikoura earthquakes in New Zealand. Response spectra from recordings of these earthquakes greatly exceeds the PGA response spectra used in its SPRA. End of comment. Okay, thank you and apologies for interrupting. I guess I'm curious since these are focused on the um, some of the seismic source characterization that were part of the previous hazard modeling that was submitted and accepted by the NRC a few years ago. Were these comments pointed out in that process? Oh, no. My, my, I've been trying to, to convey information to the California Ener Energy Commission, to the, uh, the earlier IPRA, and the seismic and the NRC and the NRC took care of any comments from me by causing me to be a 
maker of allegations with a number assigned to my allegations maker status. So anything that uh, has happened, and th this has included presentations I've made at the American Geophysical Union, the Geological Society of America, and the uh, uh, Association of Engineering and Geologists, all of which document the kinds of things I'm talking about here, and which were observed by two representatives of the NRC at the uh, last AGU presentation. Um, let's see, the guy was named, uh, oh, well, I don't want to take time trying to remember it, but anyway, there were two people, and they said, oh, this, is, this seems very interesting, and they talked to me about for about an hour after the, uh, toward the end of the session, and uh, then they went back and mentioned this to the people who are actually responsible in the NRC for making the review. And this generated yet another call to me, the maker of allegations, expressing you know, zero interest in the interpretations that I was making of the available data. And the available data is everything as of a couple of years ago, I think that PG&E had sponsored. A lot of excellent data there. Uh, what the USGS had uh, done, especially uh, Gene Hardebeck, who really found the shoreline fault, and uh, going on back to the uh, Bartlett and Kellogg surveys of the 1970s. So, yeah, I've tried to get that information out and get at least a response to it, and the response has been to not, not give any response. Well, thank you. I guess I'll kick it back to David now. I don't know that you know, we're able to respond to any of this, and I understand some of these concerns were raised previously with the IPRP in 2014, so um, I'll, I'll kick that back to you. Well, Thank let you, me though. just add that uh, I was allowed to make a fairly brief presentation to the IPRP a couple of years ago, as well as to the center of the shack presentations. Uh, during my uh, presentation, which was on the subject to the Irish Hills and the uh, Diablo Cove fault, uh, the response there by the moderator, who I believe was uh, Steve Thompson of Lettuce International, was to shut off the microphone. The uh, later re uh, response uh, of the IPRP, to whom I gave a transcript to the presentation that I made there, the color and slides and so on, and I sent that uh, to uh, the then chairman, uh, Chris Wills, and the response was total silence. So, <laughs> end of a comment again. Thank you. Well, I, mean, I don't have an encyclopedic knowledge of the past IPRP, so, I mean, I can look back and see, you said 2014? In that range is yes. when the last time. Okay, I mean, I, I can look back into it and, and get back to you, but yeah, yeah. If there wasn't any response, it certainly never came to me. So there may be one buried in the file, or maybe there just wasn't. Oh, to, to set the record straight, you know, we have been responsive to your comments, and in fact, there's a chapter in the 2014 CSIP report that we submitted to the IPRP directly addressing some of your early comments about the Diablo Cove fault and other faulting along the, the shoreline. But the that coastline. I believe was what you spent three and a half million dollars in a team of eight or nine researchers uh, sending back and forth emails with derogatory comments in the course of making that response. Which A4 and But well, let's go discovery. beyond the, to the meat of the response, which was, you know, we showed seismic reflection profiles which you know confirmed or denied some of the models that you had uh, presented in your comments. So I think you know we are on record as having recognized and responded to you. Now, um, well, I think at so this stage we are probably on record of agreeing to disagree. And 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 uh, and, and that's, that's and and I guess that's where we will leave things today. I don't know that we will accomplish anything by continuing to debate. Um, whether you feel we have adequately responded, because it sounds like we believe that we have in the CSIP report, as to whether Chris Wills and other IPRP rem members have responded to questions you've raised, that's not something I have any control over, and I can't, um, I can't offer any inputs as to whether uh, Mr. Wills or Dr. Wills was able 
provided a response to you. I only brought you. that up because I think you raised the question of have you tried to actually inform any of these agencies or pg and &E of what your ideas are. Well, we've, I know over, over the last several years, we've had numerous conversations with the IPRP, and they've certainly provided advice and input into the studies that we performed, um, certainly the high energy and low energy studies. I know we, we poured over exhaustive maps and whether we were going to hit the, uh, the desired targets, and um, I, I guess I'll, I'll leave that discussion there, and we can look at past history and if there are any outstanding issues there. But I think uh, we certainly feel that we've appropriately responded to the concerns that have been raised uh, by the IPRP and um, through other public forums, including at the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. So thank you. So um, I just had a couple things that I wanted to, to, to Gary asked me, Gary and Murray thought the Energy Commission's uh, mm -hmm. Seismic appointed to the IPRB. A couple things he wanted to bring up. Um, it, it just addresses future IPRP meetings and how we sort of go forward through this process. I'm not sure if USGS or any of the other IPRP members have the same concern. I understand Gary has discussed this with them. Well, a, a USGS is not a member of the oh, IPRP. Sorry, sorry, so sorry, just so you know, CGS, that's not you. CGS. Okay. Oh, All right. right. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, yeah. The <laughs> and the seismic hazard. Right. Um, I think. One is that we would like to develop sort of a, a clear future meeting schedule and prioritize information. Um, that was one of his concerns. I, I agree. Not the previous meeting, we sort of committed to this, and it sort of fell out of the wayside. And if, can I respond? Uh, we did reach out a number of times to Eric Green to schedule an IPRP meeting. It's not something, as I've been told at PG&E, I don't run the IPRP. It is right. a CPUC function. And we did make numerous um, outreach attempts and received no response. So we, I we think the with the experience. successor to, to David and with, um, with Eric's retirement, uh, we certainly hope to revisit that issue as well. Because I think we talked about probably every six months. Yeah, two meetings and a year. Two meetings a year. Seven, and so I, I appreciate that feedback. Thank you. Yeah. No, it, it isn't directed to pg &E. It's directed toward the sort of the in general. Mm -hmm. um, uh, we would also hopefully, once we have a schedule, then instead of you know getting information a day before the meeting, we get scheduled time so that there's enough leeway to actually review the information so that there's a better discussion. Um, I'm, once again, I'm not blaming anyone for that. It's just the just goal is issues. like going forward. Let's yeah. get this a little bit more structured and organized so that there's there's better results in general. Um, and then also potential to sort of, you know, as part of that process, outline, you know, reporting timelines, study data reporting schedules, you know, IPRP, you know, post reporting schedules, stuff like that. And I know that there's been some talk among the IPRP about, you know, prioritizing or ordering some items, and I'll leave that to them to bring up and exchange. Thank you. I mean, we'd certainly, if there are particular topics you'd like to learn more about um, or hear more about, certainly, you know, shoot me an email and we'd be happy to include that on an agenda we propose to David. Um, so just let us know if there's there's something there. Can I raise a point just for clarification? Because mm -hmm. we've, we've gone through a transition and Chris Wills from CGS was the prior uh, chair of this group. Who has assumed that mantle now? Is it I, you, David? Oh, as chair of the group? Yeah. I, I'm not entirely sure. We have not had that discussion yet as a group. I don't yeah. think the IPR has really decided how we're going to Because that. I guess one of the things that usually comes out of these meetings is that the IPR people uh, write a report. Yes. And so I'm wondering to whom. Whose lap did that fall into? It in, 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 in fell in Chris's lap, I thought. <laughs> wow. and, and actually, and I would say on some of the things on reporting and feedback, I think some of the earlier processes have generally been that the IPRP would try to provide a report within 30 days of the meeting. I think that's something that's outlined in the commission decision that um, kind of established the IPRP and how they are to advise 
on the, the things that we're suggesting or you know, our, our proposed activities. So certainly something within 30 days is great. I know sometimes things will take longer, but um, that's generally the guideline that's been outlined in the earlier decisions. And it would be great to know who would be chairing, chairing on the technical issues. I, Eric's role was certainly as facilitator for the IPRP, but um, Chris was the technical lead, and perhaps that's you as well. Um, but I don't know. You, we'll let the IPRP yeah, I mean, decide I, that. I, Just I let us know. I'm probably not the technical <laughs> lead on this, but um, I mean, that's not my background, so I, I wouldn't. If I were you, I wouldn't necessarily trust me to be the technical guy on it. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm kind of at the mercy of the group, at least in terms of determining how to go forward with the writing the report, because I think you guys have a better sense of who's capable of, of producing the report and who's, who's contributed in the past. Um, so, I mean, if, if we want to have this discussion uh, through email to kind of make a determination as to who would, who would be best to contribute to it, I'd, I'd be open to that and I can, you know, kind of sp spur everyone to get it done within a, a reasonable time frame. Not, I mean, I, you know, it's late May, <coughs> 30 days from now, I know we'll start running into probably summer vacation schedules for everybody as well. Um, but, I mean, I'd, I'd like to get a report out. That was going to be my, my next point. Yeah. And this is, this is Bruce on the phone. I, I think the, the structure of, of today's meeting, um, you know, simple, uh, for perhaps an attachment and archiving of the PowerPoints that were presented and a brief description of the subject matter that was, that was presented would be all. Oh, like, you know, this is a little bit different in that there is, there's not a specific PUC-oriented decision looming uh, on this, and the IPRP is in the process of morphing over into a, into a, a longer-running body keeping track, you know, I would think, more in terms of long-term sizing program. But a, a, a simple summary, you know, minutes, if you will, of, of what we did today probably would be useful. Uh, and a way of tracking down where where the PowerPoints might lie so we can refer to them as, as we go forward. And then I think, David, your, your idea of, a, of an email conversation as to how we move forward in terms of technical and logistic leadership would be appropriate. This is Bob Anderson. I have a, a quick question about the RPRB. Being a member of it, the question is, uh, in the past it seemed like we had a lot of trouble just meeting amongst ourselves. That was highly discouraged. And for the purpose of getting ourselves organized, uh, to have a, a single uh, voice for the future, we need to know whether we can do that or not. Is that a problem with the CPUC? Um, I, I will look into the, all the rules that kind of surround it. Um, I think there may have been some badly keen yeah. public notice of a quorum of members were discussing, but yeah, that that's yours to deal with, David. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And the second thing I have a question about what the IPRB is is a road forward as to what are the next milestones we ought to be contemplating and looking forward to uh, from uh, from PG&E, NRC, or CTC. And that's one of the things I don't really see clearly. And the final thing is looking at the composition of the IPRP. If you look at it, most of the people are geoscientists of one flavor or another. And for some of the things you're talking about now, they're really out of the realm of the geosciences and more into engineering or some other discipline. So the question would rise then, do we need to augment this IPRP, change out some of the people's positions, or do something of that nature to be able to further support the CPC in a, in a matter that makes common sense? That's all I have. All right, when, you're, when you say that, do you mean adding new organizations, new members, or new people from within the existing 
uh, groups that are already on in the IPRP? Well, I think there's a two-part answer to that, and the two parts are this. First of all, not all the organizations that are on the IPRP have the staff in hand to be able to handle some of the engineering attributes. Okay. Second is the question comes to pass of well, what IPRP is supposed to be doing. Uh, does the engineering aspects actually fall within our purview? If it in fact does, then the question is uh, we need to go back and look at the composition to make sure that we have the appropriate uh, people in line. There are usually people, I'm thinking, not adding new uh, entities, but actual personnel that are from those entities. And I know with some of the current budgets that were allotted to the IPRP before this meeting, uh, going forward, that realistically keeping more than one person or so on it, uh, there's no budget for that to bring in a licensed, experienced engineering team. And, uh, and this is brief. I, I think Bob's, Bob's observations are good ones there. You know, one, one thing to note is the IPRP was, or it was brought into being by a CPU decision on the on the rate case that, that had to do with AD um, 1632 uh, you know seismic examination and so um, the, the understanding in, in my understanding at least was that the IPRP will continue to exist to, to review you know geotech you know, geophysical geotechnical uh, seismological issues as regards uh, Diablo uh, but I I don't know that, you know, I, I think it might be useful to revisit the 2011 decision that, that brought the IPRP into, into being. And uh, maybe we could even get, get Chris Wells to sit down with us. Maybe our next IPRP meeting is a, more of a, a strategic session on where we go from here. Maybe we could persuade uh, Chris to come and, and, and guide us as to what what things we should be looking out for in the future. Well, this is Bob once again. That might be okay, but at the same time, the IPRP, whatever composition is going to be, in, should not be uh, suggesting things to the CPUC that are beyond uh, a particular composition within the IPRPs. Uh, realm of expertise and experience. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Yeah. There are ethical things and licensing things right. to deal with there. Fair, fair enough. And and with that, and I'm, I'm sorry to have to do this, but I, I do have to break off for uh, my next commitment, but um, uh, I wonder if, if we could uh, organize an email conversation on this and see, see where we might go from here. Yeah, a absolutely. I, th I think that makes sense and, and I'll also include um, a discussion of timing of the, the next meeting appro you know, approximately six okay. months from now presumably that's I think that's no November um, November December we'll, we'll we can hash that out <laughs> so okay. uh, with that thank, thank you uh, all for the contributions today and again I apologize for having to move on but I need to to move off site here to take care of the next bit of business. Okay, Ruth. Okay, take care all. Thanks. Bye-bye. So are there any other, if there's no more questions, I think we can adjourn. Great. Thank you. Thanks, folks.